Dialectic of Defeat, Contours of Western Marxism by Russell Jacobi. Chapter 3. From Philosophy to Politics, the Inception of Western Marxism 1. The term Western Marxism and European Marxism entered Marxist dictionaries in the early 1920s. The Soviet edition listed it as derogatory. By implying that a specific Marxism belonged to Western Europe, the universality of Bolshevism and the third communist international, common turn, was threatened. To the participants, this threat was not instantly evident. Moreover, the political and philosophical layers of Western Marxism unpeeled sequentially. At least this is how it appeared to Korch when he looked back. First, a specific Western Marxist politics took shape and later its philosophy was elaborated. As it moved westwards, Korch explained in 1930, this Marxist-Leninist philosophy of the Russians encountered the work of Lucas, myself and other Western communists, which formed an antagonistic philosophical tendency within the communist international itself. He added, this philosophical discussion was only a weak echo of the political and tactical disputes that the two sides had conducted so, fierce, so fiercely some years before. Of these political disputes, Korch mentioned two, Rosa Luxemburg's criticism of the Russian Revolution and the conflict between the Bolsheviks and the radical left tendency led by the Dutchman Anton Panikok and Hermann Gorder. A weak echo World War I, the collapse of the Second International, the radicalization of the working class, the Russian Revolution, brief Western European revolutions, the founding of the Third International and the new communist parties resonated for decades. The magnitude and profundity of these upheavals damned philosophical discussions to irrelevancy. By 1923, however, when Korch and Lucas published their major philosophical works, the revolutionary surges had subsided. Politics lost an immediacy, or at least the options contracted. This was not only hindsight. Lenin, Trotsky, and others remarked on the slowing of the historical tempo. The task was to dig in and prepare. If the political collisions are forgotten, the weak echo might be mistaken for the thunder itself. The philosophical feuds cannot be understood abstracted from the preceding political conflicts, nor are they identical to these conflicts. Politics permeated philosophy but did not replace it. Latent political choices infused the theoretical debates. The density of philosophy and politics in this period was not unique in the history of Marxism. However, no formula for the relationship of philosophy and politics exists. This relationship is complex and historically specific. Philosophy participated in a constellation of tactics and organizations. <clears throat> it cannot be reduced to them or for that reason dismissed. Lenin himself fell victim to the entanglement of philosophy and politics. His major philosophical work, Materialism and Imperial Criticism, sharply attacked the followers of Ernst Mack and Richard Aven Avenarius. Yet a political embarrassment marked his philosophical offensive. Many followers of Mack were political allies of Lenin, as was A. Bogdanov for a period. Conversely, the philosopher that Lenin prized most, Plekhanov, was a political opponent. For these reasons, Lenin sought to separate the philosophical and political issues. For a few years after World War I, the political arena seemed wide open. By the end of 1923, the last post-World War I offensive, the German October, was history. And even by 1921, the defeat of the European revolutions was a fact. Yet the brevity of the period does not deprive it of importance. In these years, the political contours of a Western Marxism surfaced. The situation re rarely reoccurred. The consolidation of the Russian Revolution and the rise of fascism, if they did not spell imprisonment and death, compelled unorthodox Marxists, Marxists to silently table their heresies or retreat from the political barricades. 
The history of Western Marxism between the mid-1920s and the 1950s is largely a history of these two choices. A word of caution. To shift in parts of this and the next chapter from delineating two traditions of Hegel to the politics of the common turn and communist parties is to enter a new world. No longer is the talk of Hegel's logic or phenomenology, but the 21 conditions, the march action, and even Bettelheimery. The cast of characters and political parties is long. What N. O. Brown wrote to explain his use of the strange language of Freud, but this strange world is the world we all of us actually live in, can perhaps be reformulated. This strange world is the world they, if no longer all of us, actually lived in. For this reason, it cannot be avoided. This chapter, however, seeks to pare away, as much as is feasible, extraneous details, names, and events. In this way, the danger of drowning in a sea of political incidents may be prevented and the contours of a political Western Marxism thrown into relief. The story, in any case, was fragmentary, brief, and finally unsuccessful. Yet Rosa Luxemburg, Paul Levi, and Dutch and left communists posed a series of political alternatives to the rapidly consolidating Soviet communism. They challenged the validity for Western Europe of the Russian experience and the Leninist model. As often, perhaps always, in the history of Marxism, the question of organization proved to be the terrain for political and theoretical jousting. This question incorporated a group of principles that set Marxist against Marxist. Lucas stated succinctly, organization is the form of mediation between theory and practice. A simple preference for democratic organizations did not dictate the Western Marxist repudiation of Leninism. Rather, to the Western Marxists, the yawning political and social gap between Europe and Russia prohibited an, an identical practice for each. Leninism bore the indelible marks of specific Russian conditions. A relatively small proletariat, a massive agrarian population, a feeble bourgeois culture. The last was decisive. The impact of bourgeois and national culture sharply distinguished Western European from Russian society. As Gorder wrote in the Netherlands, the oldest capitalist country, bourgeois culture and values were drummed into the working class for centuries. The same could not be said of Russia. Leninism was not blind to bourgeois culture. It responded by contracting to a tighter and more disciplined party. The infection of bourgeois culture was attributed to trade unions or an aristocracy of the working class. Since the infectious source was discreet, the organizational prescription could be sharply defined. To the Western Marxists, however, bourgeois culture was endemic and inescapable. An organizational solution did not suffice. The Western Marxists responded by retrieving from Marxism the process of class consciousness and proletarian subjectivity. Their accent on process resulted from their conviction that class consciousness was not a thing to be commanded or divulged, but attained by the class itself. Herein dwelt the democratic ethos of Western Marxism. The network of bourgeois culture and passivity could not be undone by superior discipline or directives. These remained locked within its terms, regardless of the purity and dedication of the party and its members. Rather, bourgeois hegemony could be contested only by engaging the whole of the proletariat, its hearts and minds. When class consciousness and proletarian subjectivity fused, the landscape of capitalism would light up. In this period, the, co the coherence of Western Marxism and left communism was little evident. That many left communists considered themselves loyal Leninists and that it took Lenin to disabuse them of the, of the illusion suggests the confusion. Nor were the theoretical sources identical. Korch, Lucas, Gramsci, the Frankfurt School, and later French Marxism were rooted in German idealism and the historical Hegel. This is not true of the Dutch Marxists, who looked more to Dietzken than to Hegel. Exceptions do not prove the rule, yet the Dutch Marxists are not exceptions in that the same categories surfaced in all corners of Western Marxism. 
Korch mentioned Rosa Luxemburg's critique of the Russian Revolution as one political backdrop to the philosophical disputes. Despite or because of all the secondary literature, Luxemburg resists class classification. If the interpretation of Engels indexed the philosophical separation between Western and Soviet Marxism, Luxembourg indexed the political split. For years in the Third International, Luxembourgism spelled heresy. The fate of her collected works suggests the difficulty of slipping her into conventional categories. Their publication, sponsored by the Communist Party, ceased in the late 1920s. Only after some 40 years of delay did the project recommence. Perspectives on Luxembourg and Lenin, or Luxembourg and the Bolsheviks, are themselves subject to a historical dynamic. In recent years, her differences with Lenin have been belittled. With no hesitation, she is given the official stamp of Orthodox Marxist. Originally, this effort hit serious snags, and one of the most serious was her successor in the German Communist Party, the KPD, Paul Levi. Levi mediated the impact of Luxembourg on European Marxism. He not only led the most important communist party outside the Soviet, but Levi published Luxembourg's critique of the Russian Revolution as proof of her profound antipathy to Bolshevism. Although neither her pupil nor her equal, he remained a loyal follower. Beginning as her lawyer in 1913, he belonged to both her personal and political inner circle. Shortly after her assassination in January of 1919, Levi succeeded her as leader of the German Communist Party. Within two years, he moved from the leadership to opposition to expulsion in 1921. Some 10 years after the murder of Rosa Luxemburg, Paul Levi committed suicide. In any discussion of Levi, Luxembourg, and subsequent splits in the party, the fundamental importance of German communism to the Russian Revolution and the Third International should not be forgotten. The German party was not another or even major party. It was the party, and initially, initially merely overshadowed the Russian party. Before World, World War I, the German Social Democrats, SPD, were the leading party. After the war, it was desperately hoped that the German Revolution would bail out the Russian Revolution. And it's... <clears throat> Hold on. Early conference of the Comintern were conducted in German, and its Moscow headquarters was considered a stopgap until the wider European revolutions rendered possible its relocation to Berlin. Nor was this all fantasy. The, KPT, the KPD wielded considerable clout. For instance, in 1924, the KPD received 3.7 million votes in Reich, Reichstag elections. In 1927, it was publishing 36 daily newspapers. Considering the dire straits of the Russian Revolution and the wealth, experience, and apparent expertise of the German working class movement, movement all of its developments were carefully monitored, guided, and finally controlled. Levi's presence at the Congress of Livorno in January 1921 provoked his first public opposition to the Soviets. At this party Congress, the Italian Communist Party, the PCI, was founded by splitting the Italian Socialist Party, the PSI. This was neither surprising nor unanticipated. It was in accord with Comintern policy to expel or withdraw from the reformists of the old socialist parties. In Italy, the political parties and groups debated for months which conditions of entry into the Comintern were acceptable. The Comintern and its representatives encouraged a hard line, a clean break with a wide number of reformists. They achieved their aim, but with only one third of the votes from the Congress. They departed to form the PCI. Because less than half the membership of the P PSI renewed in either party, some historians considered the split at Livorno a fatal mistake for the Italian left. Although a schism of the party seemed warranted by the facts, the particular schism that occurred at Livorno was disastrous. Thanks to that Congress and to Mussolini, the Italian left was eliminated from political life for the next 22 years. Levi returned from Livorno upset by what he had witnessed. 
He was repelled by the crudity of the Comintern representatives who promoted the split. He presented a criticism of the Comintern tactics, tactics to his own central committee. To those who argued that it was better to be few in numbers but firm in principle, Levi replied that principles without followers constitute a party no more than followers without principles. In Levi's eyes, the common turn employed tactics unsuitable for Western European parties. Levi objected to the mechanical split of the Italian party, preferring the organic bringing up of the masses. To create parties within the communist international not through organic growth with the masses but through deliberate splits was risky and unproductive. If the communist international functions in Western Europe in terms of admission and expulsion like a recoiling cannon, then he will experience in Western Europe the worst possible setback. In Levi's opinion, the Russians erased the distinction between Western Europe and Russia. They blindly applied the same organizational principles to each. It seems to me that the comrades did not clearly realize that splits in a mass party with a different intellectual structure than, for example, that of the illegal Russian party, which performed brilliantly in its own way, cannot be carried on the basis of resolutions, but only on the basis of political experience. The language and approach recall Luxembourg's distrust of politics commanded by inflexible resolutions. Levi appealed directly to her legacy. I do not want to conceal anything. The old difference between Rosa Luxembourg and Lenin emerges here again. Levi's criticism of the Comintern's conduct at Livorno was unacceptable to the new orthodoxy, nor did it help that he raised the sensitive issue of relocating to the West the Comintern headquarters. He was outvoted in his own central committee. With other supporters, he resigned from the central committee and consequently watched from the sidelines the increasing subordination of KPD to the Comintern. He did not have long to wait. Within weeks of his resignation, the common turn decisively intervened in the KPD in what came to be known as the March Action, 1921. This has been called the first insurrection in Europe attempted at the instigation and under the leadership of a team specially sent from Moscow. As a revolution, it was a debacle. The KPD membership dwindled from 450,000 to 180,000 as one consequence. It also marked a turning point in the relation of the KPD to Moscow. From this time on, the integrity and autonomy of the KPD dramatically declined. To Levi, the ill-conceived and ill-executed March action proved that the KPD and the common turn were out of touch with the proletarian masses. As Levi explained in a letter to Lenin, the March action wrecked the painstaking work of the past two years. Not only the effort to numerically enlarge the Communist Party, but the effort to root it culturally in the proletarian masses was profoundly set back. The trust of the proletarian class that the former leadership had sw sweated to gain was sabotaged. Levi's full indictment of the March action earned him expulsion from the party. In, in Our Path Against Putsch Putschism, 1921, he charged that the party and the common turn representatives organized a push, not a Marxist revolution. Theoretically, his critique moved within the parameters of Western Marxism, the Soviet party by virtue of its past as an illegal party in an agrarian country was incapable of understanding the revolutionary traditions of the West European proletariat. The Russians bypassed the cultural structure to incite the proletariat directly by a battery of resolutions and leaflets. He commented later, It's the same old nonsense that Moscow always wants to believe, namely that a Soviet-type revolution would have occurred by now if there weren't a Cerati in Italy or a Levi in Germany standing in the way. The Muscovites completely overlook the fact that conditions in, the, in Western Europe are utterly different from those in Russia. There you had an agrarian revolution, revolution with some 95% of the population in favor. In Germany, the peasants are counter-revolutionary. In Western Europe, the proletariat is tightly organized. In Russia, 
the masses were not organized. These are some of the differences that Moscow one day will have to try to grasp. Unser Weg denounced the March action as the greatest vacuumist putsch in history. The, part, the party misevaluated this subjective factor. Rather than establishing a viable relationship to the working class, the party substituted itself for the class. Any action that expresses solely the political needs of the Communist Party and not the subjective needs of the proletarian masses is in itself defective. Moreover, the political imperatives that triggered the March action were not exclusively German. As Levi wrote to Lenin shortly before the March action, a Comintern representative informed the German Central Committee that Russia found itself in an extremely grave situation, and he counseled that it is absolutely necessary that Russia be relieved by movement in the West. For that reason, the German party must immediately commence action to overthrow the regime. The common turn, Levi concluded, was isolated from Western Europe, its most important proving grounds. The lines of commun communication are poor and unreliable, the common turn representatives second rate. Alluding to Bela Kuhn's role in the March action, Levi caustically observed that naturally Russia could not afford to send its best emissaries. Western Europe and Germany became a training ground for all kinds of petty bureaucrats. The following year, Levi published Rosa Luxemburg's critique of the Russian Revolution. In his introduction, he quoted Luxemburg's earlier critique of Lenin, which concluded, Finally, we must frankly admit to ourselves that errors made by a truly revolutionary labor movement are historically infinitely more fruitful and more valuable than the infallibility of the best of all possible central committees. Levi did not challenge the revolutionary commitment of Lenin and Trotsky, but he wondered about the future once they passed from the scene. The old guard formed a small section of the party. This situation gave rise to Lenin's deepest error. He isolated and enclosed the party like a pure specimen in a laboratory, which could be maintained or improved through, through purification. He assumed a partition could be erected between the party and the broad masses. On this question, a deep antagonism existed between Luxembourg and the Bolsheviks. Levi represented Luxembourg in the first period of Bolshevization of the world communist movement. His loyalty to her ideas quickly ended his career in the party and propelled him willy-nilly on a route parallel to Western Marxism. He concluded that without the spirit and sentiment of revolution, the proletarian organization was vacant and ineffectual. It is not only the size and numbers of things, it is a spirit which blows over everything which alone can raise the proletarian revolution to its greatness. <sighs> Lenin and the Bolsheviks failed to weigh the cultural atmosphere of Western Europe which damned the insular party to irrelevancy. Lenin's ideas on organization were not absolutely false, but bore the imprint of the specific stages of the Russian Revolution, absolutism, feudalism, illegality. Certainly in the Western lands, there is a subjugation of the proletariat by the bourgeoisie, but the bourgeoisie practices its domination in the form of democracy, these were the conditions in which Rosa Luxemburg lived and worked. The challenge to revolution by command or example pulsated throughout Rosa Luxemburg's work. The proletariat as the actor subject of revolution defined her central loyalty. She distrusted the sub substitution of party leadership or the bureaucracy for the proletariat. Citing Marx and Engels that the emancipation of the working class must be its own work, she explained, but that does not mean that some committee of intellectuals, what deceptively calls itself the leader of the working class, orders or decides when and how the working class will begin on its goal of emancipation, but that the broad masses of the proletariat itself must recognize the need, the condition, and the means for emancipation, and through its own will enter into open struggle. To underline her belief in the proletariat as the actor and subject, she reversed a sentence of Marx's. 
and the famous passage in the 18th Brumaire, Marx stated that men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. In Luxembourg's formulation, men do not make history just as they please, but they make their own history. Yet the gap between Rosa Luxemburg and Luxembourgism might be as wide as those between Marx and Marxism, and even Lenin and Leninism. On a series of issues, nationalism, imperialism, and organization, Luxembourg delineated a unique position, distant from the major contemporary Marxists, Bernstein, Kotsky, and Lenin. The dif difficulty of grasping the specific contours of her oeuvre is not reason to assimilate it into the prevailing orthodoxy. By dismissing some of her texts, especially her analysis of the Russian Revolution, as products of myths or limited information, and by in reinterpreting several others, her heresies are explained away. Lately, the effort to certify her orthodoxy has increased. Her evaluation of the Russian Revolution cannot be easily dismissed, however, nor can it be severed from her 1904 critique of Lenin. She was one of the few who possessed the linguistic and political knowledge to critically appraise Lenin's organizational proposals, and she did so when Kotsky had barely heard of Lenin. If Marxism cannot be satisfied with attaining insight ex post facto, it must not be forgotten that Rosa Luxemburg advanced prescient criticism not only of the Russian Revolution in 1918, but of Bernstein in 1899, Lenin in 1904, and Kotsky in 1910. Against a generally dismal record of Marxists, Luxemburg's historical accuracy was superb. In the wake of the Russian Revolution of 1905, Luxembourg did draw closer to Lenin. However, substantial differences remained. The 1905 Russian Revolution partially provoked the issue of the mass strike among German socialists, and it led to Luxembourg's alienation from Kotsky. To delimit its use, Kotsky argued that although effective in Russia, the mass strike was inapplicable in Germany. Luxembourg contested Kotsky's reasoning of the complete antagonism of Germany and Russia. The mass strike did not express peculiar Russian conditions, but rather a general class struggle. Moreover, when Plekhanov charged Lenin with blankism, she partly retracted her own criticisms. There might be traces of it, blankism, in the organization plan that Lenin presented in 1902, she wrote in 1906, but that lies in the past. The errors were corrected through life itself, and there is no danger that could be repeated. Twelve years later, she charged Lenin and Trotsky with Jacobinism. Luxembourg did not worship spontaneity uncritically, nor did she fully escape significant ambivalences. She did retain an, an, an unswerving commitment to the proletariat as the subject of history, however, and she conceived this not simply as a philosophical statement, but as a political statement. Here she differed with Bernstein, Kotsky, and Lenin. Each crippled the processes of subjective development of the proletariat. She indicted Bernstein and the revisionists for suppressing the subjective factor of the socialist transformation. They conflated means and ends, or they misinterpreted trade unions as a goal and not as a means of awareness and consciousness. For Luxembourg, the process of the proletariat attaining class consciousness constituted the heart and soul of revolution. One reformist presented the, cho the choice of aiming a real pistol of the ruling at the ruling class or the pistol of parliamentary majorities. Luxembourg believed that this missed the essence of Marxism, the power of the class conscious proletariat. Luxembourg also broached a psychological dimension to this subjectivity. Although this was not decisive to her analysis, it marked a typical Western Marxist motive or motif. The subject of history, the proletariat, was not simply a theoretical dream, but flesh and blood, thought and feelings. Proletarian passivity could not be cleaved from psychological passi passivity. That Luxembourg raised the issue in her 1904 critique of Lenin suggested the very different impact and consequences of industrialization on the Western and Russian proletariats. Luxembourg reviewed One Step Forward, Two Steps Backwards, 1904, which with what is to be done represented Lenin at his most inflexible. 
Lenin celebrated the factory as a model for revolutionary organizations, and he derided criticism of it as arist aristocratic and in intellectual. For the factory, which seems only a bogey to some, represents that high, that highest form of capitalist cooperation which has united and disciplined the proletariat, taught it to organize and placed it at the head of all other sections of the toiling and exploited population. And Marxism, the ideology of the proletariat trained by capitalism, has been and is teaching unstable intellectuals to distinguish between the factory as a means of exploitation and the factory as a means of organization, discipline based on collective work. The discipline and organization which comes so hard to the bourgeois intellectual are very easily acquired by the proletariat just because of this factory schooling. To Luxembourg, the model was critically flawed, an obstacle to revolution. To the extent that the Marxist organization imitated factory discipline and organization, it betrayed revolution. The Marxist or social democratic organization did not adopt and generalize past bourgeois formations, but it reconstructed them from the inside. The revolutionary organization required a complete revision of the concept of organization, a whole new content for the concept of centralism, and a whole new conception of the reciprocal relation of the organization and struggle. Independent direct action of the masses belonged to the nucleus of the revolutionary organization. Consequently, it cannot be based on blind obedience nor on the mechanical subordination of the party militants to a central power. Luxembourg believed that the discipline and obedience instilled by factory life did not encourage but crippled revolutionary action. It is to be undone, not prescribed. She stated, socialism in life demands a complete spiritual transformation in the masses, degraded by centuries of bourgeois class rule. She distanced herself from Lenin's glorification of the educational influence of the factory on the proletariat, which makes it immediately ripe for organization and discipline. The discipline which Lenin has in mind is implanted in the proletariat not only by factory, but also by the barracks, by modern bureaucracy bureaucratism. In short, by the whole mechanism of the centralized bourgeois state. It is nothing but an incorrect use of the word when at one time one designates as discipline two so opposed concepts as the absence of thought and will in a mass of flesh with many arms and legs moving mechanically and the voluntary coordination of conscious political acts by a social stratum. There is nothing common to the corpse-like obedience of a dominated class and the organized rebellion of class struggling for its liberation. It is not by linking up with the discipline implanted in him by the capitalist state, but by breaking, uprooting the slavish spirit of discipline, that the proletariat can be educated for the new discipline, for the voluntary self-discipline of social democracy. Luxembourg's Russian Revolution does not require extensive discussion, yet its Western European or its West European perspective is often minimized. She did not condemn the Bolshevik practices in themselves, but in regard to their impact on Western Europe. Their success encouraged slavish imitation. This was the danger. She feared that the European working class would succumb to imitating the Bolsheviks. Therefore, she wanted to delay founding the Third International until active Western European parties could check the influence of the Bolsheviks. She also resisted adopting the name Communist Party as foreign to German revolutionary traditions. Nor was Luxembourg in doubt about the decisive con contextual fact of the Russian Revolution, the absence or failure of the West European revolutions. This failure exacted a double toll. It increased the attractiveness of the successful Bolsheviks and, at the same time, deformed their practices. Her analysis of the Russian Revolution moved within these parameters. External circumstances damaged revolutionary practices. Consequently, the Russian Revolution was less a model to be emulated than it was an example of the difficulties of isolated socialism. Luxembourg set herself against the gravitational pull of success. 
The brutal international situation dictated the brutality of the Russian Revolution. The complete failure of the international working class allowed few choices. Under such fatal conditions, even the most gigantic idealism and the most storm-tested revolutionary energy are incapable of realizing democracy and socialism, but only distorted attempts at either. She had no doubts the Bolsheviks must be supported enthusiastically. What they created under the conditions of bitter compulsion and necessity, however, cannot be regarded by the international working class as a shining example of socialist policy. The abdication of the international proletariat, she reaffirmed at the close of her analysis, dominated the events of the Russian Revolution. The starting and end term of this abandonment was the failure of the German proletariat. Under these conditions, socialism was necessarily distorted. The danger begins only when they make a virtue of necessity and want to freeze into a complete theoretical system all the tactics forced upon them by the fateful circumstances and want to recommend them to the international proletariat as a model of socialist tactics. This guided her critique. She did not recommend choices that the Russian Revolution did not have. She criticized undemocratic policies not to reform the Bolsheviks, but to break decisively with anti-democratic tactics of German socialism. The revolutionary action of the German proletariat cannot be called forth in the spirit of the guardianship method of the German social democracy. It can never again be conjured forth by a spotless authority, be it that of our own higher committees or of the Russian example. In words that recall Marx and Labriola, she declared, not by the creation of a revolutionary hurrah spirit, but quite the contrary, only by an insight into all the fearful seriousness, all the complexity of the tasks involved, only as a result of political maturity and independence of spirit, only as a result of a capacity for critical judgment on the part of the masses. Only thus can the genuine capacity for historical judgment be born in the German proletariat. The second political dispute that the philosophical conflict echoed was, according to Korch, the disagreement that culminated in the years 1920 to 1921 between the radical left tendency led by the Dutch communist Pinnacoke and Gorder and the Russian Bolshevik faction led by Lenin. This was not a minor squabble, but in the first period of, of the Comintern, a divisive, divisive threat to Soviet Marxism nor was it confined to the small Dutch party. German communism, in which Panikok and Gorder played roles, was equally menaced. Moreover, as Lenin himself discussed, the left tendency stretched across Europe. That a small band of Dutch Marxists predominated in what became known as left communism may not be entirely fortuitous. Gorder observed that Holland was the oldest bourgeois country in Western Europe, older than England and France. By the very length of its rule and its victories and power, the Dutch bourgeoisie profoundly dominated Dutch society. The bourgeois spirit saturated the entire people. There is no country more bourgeois than Holland, announced Gorder. No country where the bourgeois spirit is more deeply rooted. This advanced post of bourgeois society spawned advanced critics and theorists, at least the Dutch Marxists, or what became known as the Dutch school, first coherently elaborated principles later adopted by left communists. The singular impact of bourgeois culture and ideology on the working class constituted their point of departure. Their Marxism incorporated categories of Geist, mind, culture, and consciousness. Prior to the break with the Bolsheviks, Panikok argued that these categories were more than categories. They imbued social relations. Marxists could ignore them only by periling a revolutionary transformation. For instance, Gorder's Historical Materialism, 1908, asserted that Geist pervaded the commo commodity society. The power of the bourgeoisie rested as much on its spiritual as its military or political arms. 
For the socialists, spiritual propaganda was not extraneous, but essential. Geist must be revolutionized. Although such statements might belly the materialism of Marxism, they must be evaluated in the light of their specific political contexts. The issues of the pre-World War socialist movement. Unlike Germany and the Netherlands, the pre-war debates between the revisionists and the radicals among the socialists led to a complete break. In 1909, the Dutch Socialist Party, the SDAP, expelled the radicals, who then formed a competing and smaller party. Many of its members later entered the Dutch Communist Party. Before their expulsion, Panikok and Gorder, as well as Henriette Roland Holst, sharply criticized the SDAP for its anti-socialist tendency, namely its search for direct success, the approaches to burger democracy, the abandonment of the class standpoint. These Dutch had already distinguished themselves as uncompromising critics of revisionism, which added to their prestige as post-World War I critics of Soviet Marxism. In 1906, Panikok moved to Germany to participate in the newly founded SPD Party School. The school, a stronghold of the anti-revisionist left, included Luxembourg. Panikok's propo proposal for his course, Historical Materialism and Social Theory, included a section on the human or cultural sciences. Kotsky, to whom the proposal had been sent, balked. Panikok retorted that a clear understanding of the role and nature of spirit and the spiritual was imperative. With Luxembourg, Panikok was drawn into the debate on the mass strike that transpired in the German party, and like Luxembourg, he criticized Kotsky. His analysis recalled Gorders, the categories of subjectivity and Geist commanded. Over the next 10 years, the contours of his position changed little. Panikok articulated the same principles against Kotsky in 1912 and Comintern in 1920. Panikok posed some elementary questions. Given its numerical and economic superiority, why had not the proletariat attained power? How did a smaller exploiting minority, the bourgeoisie, dominate a larger mass? The conventional answer of the political and military muscle of the bourgeoisie did not suffice. On a raw empirical level, the working class possessed the greater power, yet the cultural superiority of the bourgeoisie compensated for its material weakness. The bourgeois minority controlled the vehicles of culture and education, schools, churches, and newspapers. By these means, bourgeois values and perspectives infected the masses. This intellectual dependence on the bourgeoisie is one of the major causes of the weakness of the proletariat. The cultural atmosphere mediated and sustained the exercise of power. Cultural power is the most powerful force in the human world. Yet the technical reason for the reign of the bourgeoisie is not to be forgotten. It also wielded a superior organization, the state. This analysis prompted two conclusions. The proletariat was faced with two tasks, attaining knowledge and an organization to challenge the state. Unlike the purely objective factors, such as the size of the proletariat, these allowed choice and decision. Knowledge was the first and simplest form of class consciousness and enabled the proletariat to free itself from spiritual dependency on the bourgeoisie. Organization could not be severed from class consciousness. This was the cutting edge to Panikok, anticipating Lucas. Class consciousness and organization were more than connected, they nearly merged. The proletariat could not militarily defeat the bourgeoisie, nor could it compete with state power. The fiber and strength of the proletarian organization lay rather in its solidarity, esprit, and discipline. The specific virtues of the proletarian organization, which negated individualism, were foreign to the bourgeoisie. The proletarian organization transcended a collection of individuals formally bound together. At its marrow were bonds, commitments, and relationships. 
For Panacoke, these surpassed economic and political loyalties, shading into a cultural or spiritual dimension. The essence of this organization is something spiritual. It is the complete transformation of the proletarian character. Referring to his proposal to curb use of the mass strike or mass action, Panikok charged Kotsky with actionless waiting, passive radicalism, and more gravely, misconceiving the nature of organization. For Panikok, subjectivity, class consciousness, and organization welded together. These constituted the very essence and hope of the proletariat. The ethos of the, of the proletarian organization not only rendered it resilient, but signaled the commencement of socialism. It carved out territory beyond bourgeois individualism. In a continuation of the debate, Panikok responded to the countercharge that the spirit of organization was ethereal, floating above society. To Panikok, it permeated and defined the proletariat. Kotsky failed to distinguish a proletarian organization from a whist club or any other group. If statues and funds were required, they did not consist. If statutes and funds were required, they did not constitute a working class organization. Kotsky attended only the external form of organization. The internal processes, however, were critical. These sustained relations that challenged the domination of the bourgeoisie. Nor were they mystical or irrelevant. They included the transformation of the character of the proletariat. Both the strength of the proletariat and its emancipatory capacity rested on these processes. The development of the proletariat organization in itself signifies the repudiation of all the functions of class rule. It represents the self-created order of the people. The source for some formulation of Panikok and the Dutch school was not so much Hegel as Joseph Dietzkin. Especially after the turn of the century, Dietzkin, a tanner and an autodidactic or auto, autodidact, attracted a group of enthusiastic adherents. The skeptical, including Marx, doubted his real achievements. From an independent and isolated standpoint, he completed or complemented historical materialism. He drew on Feuerbach more than Hegel and wrote to Marx that Feuerbach showed me the way. In fact, Marx bemoaned to Engels that precisely Hegel, precisely Hegel he, Ditskin, did not study. Ditskin's impact was limited. Panikok noted in 1902 that he did not until then exert he did he had not until then exerted any perceptible influence on the socialist movement. Nevertheless, the Dutch school devoted much attention to Ditskin. Panikok wrote incessantly on Ditskin. Gorder translated him into Dutch. Roland Holst wrote a book on him. Ditskin's first and most important work, The Nature of Human Brain Work, 1869, extended dialectics to conceptual and abstract thought. What Ditskin achieved is less important than what the Dutch found in him, a valuable mental and intellectual supplement to Marx. The weak spot in Marx, according to Panikok, was that he never fully explained how mind was entangled in the material process. Marx affirmed and proved the general dependence of mind on the material conditions, but he did not set forth the specific links. Here, Ditzkin entered. Refracted through Panikok, Ditzkin illuminated subjectivity and consciousness. To follow Panikok, there is no lack of economic development. The material world had long been ripe for socialism. What is lacking is men. Mankind is not a marionette of economic forces. These forces dominate by means of ideas and perceptions through the mind. Reversing Marx and following Luxembourg, Panikok stated that mankind does not make history as it pleases, but it makes history. Spirit must actively intervene. Economic development will yield social revolution only insofar as it produces in the spirit of men revolutionary thought and revolutionary will. This is where Ditzkin's contribution lies. 
Marx gave us the science of social and human action. Diskin gave us the theory of the human spirit. With the rise of left communism in 1919, the Dutch Marxists received wider European attention. For Orthodox Marxists, left communism passed into history only by way of denunciation in Lenin's left-wing communism and in infantile disorder. In the Leninist vocabulary, the quotation marks around left crystallized the definition. Left communism was left in name only. Nothing stood left of the official communist parties. Left communism was more than a theoretical aberration, however. In 1919 to 1920, it was the threat to the common turn. Left communism surfaced throughout Europe. It did not constitute a coherent formation, but a series of groupings, organizations, and journals. Panacoke and Gorder were prominent in several. For instance, in the first year of the common turn, secondary boroughs or, secretarians, or secretariats were established in Amsterdam, Berlin, and Vienna to coordinate European activities. Two in particular challenged the common turn by adapting or adopting left positions. Amsterdam and Vienna. The Amsterdam Bureau included Gorder, Roland Holst, and Panikok, its spiritual leader. It openly criticized the common turn and even held a conference. Moscow quickly closed it for its insubordination. The Vienna Bureau fell under the sway of exiles from the defeated Hungarian Revolution, including Lucas, and met a similar fate. The organ of the Comintern Bureau in Vienna was Communismus, which printed many of the essays that later composed history and class consciousness. It also published Panacoke. The same roles were assumed in Italy by, Ber by Bordiga's Il Soviet, which published Lucas and Panacoke, and in England by Sylvia Pankhurst's Workers Dreadnought. The Worker's Dreadnought, one of the best informed and cosmopolitan newspapers of the period, ran Lucas, as well as fundamental texts of Gorder and Luxembourg. These included Gorder's open letter to Lenin, discussed later, and Luxembourg's critique of the Russian Revolution, which Levi had publicized. These were theoretical icings, however, to larger political and social movements. Left communism was a political expression of Western Marxism. They are inextricably linked, but not identical. Left communism did not speak a philosophical language, although it contested the Bolsheviks politically. <coughs> Briefly, left communism in Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands wrote off parliaments and trade unions as vehicles for a revolution. Lenin prescribed their use, but to the left, these institutions belonged to a reformist and bankrupt past of socialism. The communists could not at will manipulate parliaments and trade unions as if they were neutral instruments. By their very nature, parliaments and unions encouraged illusions in the working class about the revolutionary process. Several other principles and sensibilities sustained these political positions. A gut hatred for authoritarianism and bureaucratization marked the left communists. They prized autonomy and self-regulation of the proletariat. From this perspective, they mounted a critique not only of the bourgeois institutions of the parliament, but of the vanguard and Leninist party, with the important exception of Bordiga, who is discussed in chapter five. Consequently, they celebrated, again with the exception of Bordiga, workers' councils, factory councils, and Soviets. Unlike parliamentary or trade union bureaucracies, these rested on the autonomy and independence of the proletariat. For the left communists, the vanguard party shared a lethal weakness with bourgeois institutions. It substituted leadership for the self-movement of the proletariat. On its most theoretical level, the left communists justified their political positions by themes familiar to Western Marxism the decisive role of class consciousness and subjectivity. Panikok and Gorder were closely associated with one of the few left communist groups that seriously challenged common turn leadership, the Communist Workers' Party of Germany, KAPD. 
Panikok provided much of the theoretical inspiration for the program of the KP- KAPD, and Gorder personally participated. The circumstances from which the KAPD emerged are as follows. The KPD, under Paul Levi's leadership, pursued a dual strategy. Clamp down on the left in the party to mollify and finally unite with the much larger and less radical Independent Social Democrats, USPD. Already at the Second Party Congress, October 1919, the party leadership clashed with the left. A resolution attacked the left or syndicalist interpretation of the irrelevancy of parliamentary elections. It also sanctioned the use of trade unions and the strictest centralization in the party. Each of these issues, parliaments, trade unions, authoritarian leadership, provoked the left wing. Not only did the resolution pass, but it called for the expulsion of the opposition. This resolution, as well as dissatisfaction with the lack of activity of the KPD during the the cap putsch, formed the immediate backdrop to the most important split in the K in the KPD in its initial years. The KAPD. At its foundation, half the membership of the KPD belonged to it. The KAPD's call for a new party, April 1920, denounced the KPD's reformism and corruption. It declared that the KAPD is no party in the traditional sense. It is not a leadership party, and it pledged unity of the proletariat on the basis of councils. The theoretical perspective of Western Marxism and the political activity of left communism intersected briefly. Political and tactical issues of parliaments, trade unions, and bureaucratic leadership predominated. Yet these political positions in turn tapped theoretical principles of Western Marxism. Tackedly, as well as explicitly, revolution was dissected as a process of the subject, the proletariat, attaining class consciousness. The formulations threw into sharp relief the subjective dimension of the historical process, including its psychological contours. The program of the KAPD, May 1920, stated that the economic and political situation in Germany was overripe for revolution. Insofar as the objective conditions existed, the restraining conditions were subjective. In other words, the ideology of the proletariat is still partly the prey of bourgeois or petty bourgeois conceptual elements. The psychology of the German proletariat in its present composition carries only too clearly the marks of centuries of military enslavement, as well as marks of an insufficient self-consciousness. The subjective movement plays in the German Revolution a decisive role. The problem of the German Revolution is the problem of the development in self-consciousness of the German proletariat. In the same year as the KAPD program, Panikok published one of his most important pieces, World Revolution and Communist Tactics. The text that Communismus published, it also appeared as a pamphlet, included an editorial note commenting that it was a very important contribution, although it might stand in certain antagonism to the line of the Moscow Executive Committee. This was an understatement. Panikok observed that in the first flush of enthusiasm for the Russian Revolution, the difficulties facing the revolution in Western Europe were underestimated. The experience showed that the German Revolution will be a slow, arduous process. For this reason, tactics become more than tactics, translating into long-range choices grounded on general principles and observations. Two propositions sustained the tactical choices. Ideological and subjective pressures crippled the revolutionary process, and these pressures afflicted Western Europe more than Russia. In Western Europe, the bourgeoisie dominated long and successfully. In November 1918, state power slipped from the nerveless grasp of the bourgeoisie in Germany and Austria. The masses were in control, and the bourgeoisie was nevertheless able to build the state power up again and once more subjugate the workers. This proves that the bourgeoisie possessed another hidden source of power, which had remained intact and which permitted it to reestablish its hegemony when everything seemed shattered. 
This hidden power is the bourgeoisie's ideological hold over the proletariat. Because the proletarian masses were still completely governed by a bourgeois mentality, they restored the hegemony of the bourgeoisie with their own hands after it had collapsed. The hegemony of bourgeois ideology or the control of education, culture, and schools constituted the concrete force that suffocated the revolution. And this hegemony rooted on the, in the long history of a tenacious and supple bourgeoisie distinguished Western Europe and countries colonized by West Europeans, the United States, Australia, from the Soviet Union. The strength of the bourgeoisie, Panacoke explained elsewhere, did not emanate exclu exclusively from its money or arms, but also from the domination of bourgeois culture over the whole population, including the proletariat. During a century of the bourgeois period, the bourgeois intellectual life penetrated the entire society and produced a mental organization and discipline which reached and dominated the masses through thousands of canals. Thus, the resistances which the proletariat in the old bourgeois countries must overcome in itself are much greater than in the new countries of Eastern Europe, which lack that bourgeois culture. Gorder's contribution from the same year took the form of an open letter to Lenin, responding to his pamphlet, Left-Wing Communism. Gorder hammered away at the same issues as Panacoke. He paid particular attention to the powerful distinction between Russia and Western Europe in regard to class formation. These differences question extrapolations of tactics and principles from the Russian to the West European situation. Europe lacked a large and impoverished peasantry. Consequently, the proletariat was deprived of poten potential agrarian allies. The relative isolation of the proletariat compounded its task. Thrown back on its own sources and resources, it faced an entrenched bourgeoisie. Unlike Eastern Europe in the West, the ideology of the bourgeoisie overpowered the whole social and political life. It has sunk deeper in the minds and hearts of the worker. How to uproot the traditional bourgeoisie thinking which paralyzes the proletariat defines the tactical problem. The conventional dependence on leaders, parliaments, and trade unions would be worse than no help. It would ratify the forms of bourgeois domination. Gorder closed his letter by repudiating Lenin's statement that the period of propaganda was past referring to the German, Austrian, Hung and Hungarian situations, Gorda wrote, the most serious economic crisis is there, and yet the revolution does not come. There must be another cause which brings about revolution, and when it is not active, the revolution fails or miscarries. This cause is the spirit of the masses. The neglect of the spirit, the culture, the minds of the proletariat eviscerated the Third International. By 1921, the KEPD had suffered its first of many splits. After several years, the history of the KEPD and left communism in Germany became the history of small groups. Orthodox Leninists relished this fate. It confirmed their criticisms of the irrelevancy of left communism. It is indubitably true that only for a historical moment did the factors gel in which German left communists might have decisively intervened. Nor was left communism and especially council communism without serious flaws. Yet their failure is a fact, nothing more. Fragmentation may not inhere in left communism. It may be a byproduct of failure and defeat and indeed may have guaranteed them. What beclouds the historical record is the illusion that the victors, Orthodox Leninism and the common turn, won. They too failed, regularly and perhaps with fewer justifications. The hypnotic spell of success conspires to perpetuate history as a permanent defeat.